all stand and sing our welcome song. If you aren't familiar with the words, they're printed in the front of the bulletin. I'd ask the deacon of the month, Felix Gravino, to come. Let us pray. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for dying for our sins. We thank you for teaching us how to love. Thank you for giving us our pastor, our church family. Lord, have mercy on us as we are full of faults. Lord, forgive us our sins, and we ask that you hear our prayers and that you let us uh, pray for those who are maybe suffering with sickness or any other adversity. In your holy name, amen. And now let's worship God in song. Hymn number 390, we are called to be God's people. Number 591, Hark the Voice of Jesus Calling.
Thank you. Remain standing for the morning prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the childlike approach and expectancy of praying, humbly pleading your promises and relying alone on the merits of your Son, Jesus. Push back the protruding world, hush its clamor, silence its call, and give us gracious internal peace that our worship today may be purged of all unreality and distractions. Here we are assembled together again at the foot of your cross as we believe there is room at the cross for all of us who will lift our eyes and gaze upon your salvation. You, Jesus, are the center and the circumference of life. The sun gives no light, the sky has no stars, the landscape no beauty, the flower no fragrance without you. In you is food for all our hungers, cool water for our parched thirst, light for our gloom, energy for our task, and warmth for cold nights, and a faithfulness that dispels all our doubts. Our God, you know we are prone to forget you in the busy rush of life, while our good health and comfortable life befriends us. But you are our prompt refuge and defense also in times of illness, grief, failure. And we ask your forgiveness. Preserve us from danger. Defend us from the errors of our heart. Deliver us out of temptation. Save us from murmuring, envy, pride, hate, and lies, from waste of time and excessive pleasures. Rather, give us a radiant face, a forthright hand, and the wisdom of a word fitly spoken. Remember those in authority over us. Put your fear in their hearts that, like you did the Israelites, that they may faithfully discharge their responsible duties. May your spirit rest on all our people, causing us to lead peaceable, quiet, orderly lives. Let the day soon dawn when men shall permit your justice to right every wrong and when truth and love shall rule over the affairs of men. So broaden our vision, deepen our earnestness, lengthen our love for one another, intensify our reverence, and increase our usefulness. For we ask not for lighter burdens, but for greater strength, not for easier discipline, but for greater grace. May we trust even we, we cannot trace your providence. Speak through our tongues, work through our hands, send our feet on your errands. Speed the glad day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess Jesus as Lord and Savior to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Romans 5, 8, 
God's word tells us that God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. My sin upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers, it was my sin that held him there, until Thank you, Beverly. Let me ask you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse number 1. Our text is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 5. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. And may God bless the reading of his word. There is a, a change in the letter that Paul has been writing to this church. And it's at this point where you start seeing him making some closing statements and some closing arguments. He's already presented what he's going to say. But he's at this place where he's trying to, to encourage them with the last little bit of uh, ink he might have in this letter. So it was very early on in Paul's ministry that he 
he was introduced to this very wonderful, and as we've seen from the letter, this encouraging church. Time would tell Paul that not all churches are the same, not all churches are so wonderful, not all churches are so encouraging. And so what we, what we do know is this was early on in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And so I think as we look at that and think about that, God anchored him down to the best church that he encountered before he encountered some of the others. And so we read about this wonderful church here as we start closing this letter out. So in 1st and in 2nd Thessalonians, he wrote to the church, wrote to this church, and why, why we know this was a distinctly different church is he never condemned them for anything. As in some of the other letters that he wrote, there's no suggestion of a sin issue. There's no um, instance of defection from the faith as there were in some other uh, churches. There were no doctrinal heresies that he had to correct. This, is, this was his first encounter as a missionary and as a pastor. But these two letters, they basically had instruction regarding the second coming, the rapture of the church, the coming day of the Lord, and to help clarify some of the eschatology that they knew a little bit of. And everything else that Paul wrote about were were encouraging uh, statements here for this church. Everything else speaks to the privilege that he had to, to know these people and the joy that, that they brought to his heart. And so Paul, in this seg segment of Scripture, he talks about the faithfulness of the Lord. You see, the Lord, and I want to focus on verse number 3, as you'll see here in a moment. Verse 3, let's read it again. But the Lord is faithful. And let's stop right there. Paul writes here, but the Lord is faithful. And the way this is constructed in the Greek, it's kind of interesting. Because Paul, he puts this word faithful at the front of the sentence. And so it's faithful is the Lord. And I think that's significant because he wants to stress the importance. Because in the Greek language, you would, you would front load the sentence with the most important matter as we see here. And so he's talking about the faithfulness of God and how God is faithful. Paul wanted to draw the attention of, of this encouraging church to the faithfulness of God. The Lord intends to win. Therefore, through his faithfulness, he encourages us as his church. He encourages us as his people and reminds them of his purpose and he reminds us that his will and his work will be perpetuated. God's about winning the game. And it's not really a game, but he's about winning. He's about guiding us so that we would be successful in whatever endeavor we undertake for the Lord. Because ultimately, as we recognize this is God's plan, it's his mission, and we simply are participants on the journey. So in this particular section of the letter... Paul reminds this church of the Lord's faithfulness. And he tells them God is worthy of our trust and belief. We can trust him in the storms. We can trust him in the difficulties. There are many of us who have a difficult time trusting the Lord. And it's because so many people around us and so many circumstances around us have gone awry. And the people, we just were not able to depend on people. And so somehow we equate the same attitude with the Lord God Almighty. But Paul wanted them to understand that no matter what was going on, God was faithful. I've heard that people have become Christians just to escape difficulty, but, but that's not the case. God does not uh, cause us to escape difficulties. And sometimes it, it's easy to pray this way, and we want to pray that way. But as we heard a few moments ago, sometimes we pray for the burden to be lifted, but we need to pray that we have enough grace and strength to carry on and go through. So being a Christian doesn't exclude us from problems. It doesn't exclude us from trials or tribulations. It does not exclude us from being disliked. It doesn't exclude us from discrimination or even dangers. God does not exempt his children from stress. 
We can just talk about what's going on in our world today. We can talk about the, the lives of the people in our church and the difficulties that we even heard just a few moments ago that we endure. But God carries us through. He brings us through those things. God is still faithful. J.B. Phillips puts it this way. He does not promise to temper the wind to the shorn land. He does promise to help us. He does promise to take us out. He promises to not overwhelm us. He promises to carry us through and to bring us through a situation. We see the Old Testament story of Job, who was a man who was upright. In fact, as the, as the Old Testament book tells us, Job was a unique individual, regarded and revered because of his, his wealth that God had blessed him with. He was revered and regarded because he was a godly and upright man. And as that story is recounted, we, we read how, how God, uh, how the angels of the Lord and how the, uh, even Satan was coming before the throne of God. And, and God said, consider my servant Job. And sometimes God allows these difficulties in our life. And so Paul wants us to understand as he is encouraging us here in this passage of scripture to persevere. You see, throughout the trials of Job's life, God remained faithful and, was, and Satan was only allowed to go to a certain point in the sifting process. God restrained Satan and he comforted Job. God restrains the problems in our life and he only puts on us and he allows those things to come upon us that we can, we can endure or those times in which we need even more of his grace, even more of his strength. He is faithful. So Paul, by using this term, this idea of the Lord, rather than God, tells him that he believes that Jesus is the one who at the appropriate time is going to be the one who exacts punishment on the enemies of Christ, which we've talked about in great, to great extent in some of our other messages. So this was a promise for this Christian community that God is faithful, God is going to carry them through, and God is going to take care of whatever's going on on the other side. Sometimes we just ask, how long is the Lord going to tarry? How long is he going to allow these things to take place? And, and I don't know the answer, but I know in the fullness of time, he's going to make things right. And we have that promise. And the Christian community in Paul's writing here uh, found their hope and their confidence in the Lord, regardless of whatever opposition they suffered, regardless of whatever difficulty they may have endured. And we've talked about the Thessalonian church. They were persecuted just simply because they were followers of Jesus Christ. They were never promised to have an easy life. And so Paul encourages them with, with a stalwart faith. In verse 4, he, he tells them that he has a deep-rooted confidence in the faithfulness of God. And this comes from a firm relationship with the Lord God Almighty. He trusted God, and we must trust God. You see, the Lord is faithful. Secondly, the Lord is faithful. He will establish you. Verse 4 again, and we have this confidence in the Lord about you. Now, Paul was a remarkable individual. He was, a, he was well taught. He was highly educated. He was a very capable man. He could have done many things on his own, but, but he found that his trust was in the Lord, that it was the Lord God Almighty that established him. And it is God who establishes us in our Christian faith. Yes, it's our faith. We're part of the story. Yes, we have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But it is God who establishes us. God causes us to stand firm. He gives us the faith. He gives us the ability. He gives us absolutely everything. And so it's essential that we pray. That is why Paul asks for people to pray for him. He needed God's Holy Spirit to give him that strength to govern him and to guide him. He needed God's Holy Spirit to accomplish his mission. Now, we're never really at a place where we no longer need prayer. We never really arrive at a place where we go beyond being tempted. So Paul is asking for those around him to intercede on his behalf. You may think, well, what purpose is there in praying for somebody like Paul? Why would Paul ask for people to pray for him? Why is it? Well, you might think that, that Paul was a spiritual giant. 
He was strong and he was capable and he withstood the wiles of the Jews and he, he withstood wicked people. Certainly he could handle this Christian life on his own, but he couldn't. He understood that his strength and his power rested in the, the working of God's Holy Spirit. And he understood that this came from the prayers of God's people, certainly from his own prayers as he uttered them and as he ushered them before the throne of God. But he pleaded for the prayers of the people that he was in contact with. There's sometimes people will come to me and say, Pastor, I want you to pray for this because I know you're closer to God than I am. And my question is, why is that? That's just not the case. We're, we're on equal footing. Hopefully I spend more time or ample time in prayer. And hopefully I'm cultivating my relationship with the Lord. But, but hopefully you are as well. And so we stand before the Lord on equal footing. And so Paul was praying for, or asking for people to pray for him because they were equal. And you see, you and I, you, we need to pray for one another. We pray for God to keep us upright and holy, for God to, to protect us on our journey. But Paul, most specifically here, he is praying and he is asking that they pray that the mission would go on. Do you want, to, want me to tell you what my most important task is as a pastor and how you can pray for me? I'm doing it right now. This is the most important mission I have. Now, it's supported and it's strengthened as I deal with people and as I come to your homes and, and as we fellowship together. But this is paramount. This is God's word. There are so many pastors throughout our country and throughout our world who take this too lightly. But this is the proclamation of the word of God. It is all, it's an almighty task that comes from the Lord God Almighty. Pray for me. Pray that as I stand before you that I preach God's word, not man's word. There's a push in our world today to temper it down, to somehow lay to rest the truth. But we as Christians, me as a pastor, it is paramount that I proclaim the word. It is paramount that as you hear this message, that you understand that this is a message that comes from prayer, from study, and from the power of God's Holy Spirit. So pray, just like Paul asked. Paul needed the power of God's Holy Spirit. I need it too. I need your prayers because there are moments on the journey for Paul and there are moments on the journey for every pastor in which you just feel downtrodden. You feel beaten because you've been dealing with so many things, so many things that just need to be lifted up before the Lord. And so Paul was proclaiming and he was asking that you pray for him. Paul is emphasizing this idea of prayer, not necessarily for earthly blessings. Not that that's wrong. But in 2 Corinthians 11.25, Paul said this, Three times I was beaten uh, with rods. Once I was stoned three times. I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was drift at sea. And Paul didn't ask them about praying for his comfort. He prayed that God's mission, God's word would continue to grow and abound. This was his most important task. He was saying, don't necessarily pray about these things. These are important, but pray this way. Pray that the mission of God, that the ministry of the work of the Holy Spirit would be in his life and he would proclaim the message for the success of the message. And he said, pray that the word of God would spread quickly. Now, we live in, obviously, the Bible Belt. And we can say all day long that the Word of God is prevalent around here. And yes, it is, because I would imagine that in hundreds and thousands of churches across our area and across our state, the Word of God is being proclaimed today. But how often do we really see the power of God's Holy Spirit working in the lives? How many times do we see people saved? How many times do we see people just falling down and saying, Father, forgive me, I'm a sinner, and wanting to walk in a closer manner to the Lord? We know this happens when the word is preached. Lives are touched because it's God's Holy Spirit working. And so Paul was praying for this. So Paul didn't directly pray for his personal comfort or even to be established in the gospel himself, but for the progression of the gospel, specifically the word of the Lord. That's what he's praying about, that the word of the Lord would go on. This is not to say that we shouldn't pray about the well-being of others. I mean, when you... When you call and say, Pastor, I've got this going on in my life, I'm praying about it. Pastor, we, we see this going on in our country. 
I'm praying about it, and I, I hope you are too, because this is our responsibility. My responsibility is to proclaim the word, and we as a body of believers, it is our task to be people who pray for one another, to pray about the mission, to pray about the proclamation of God's word, to pray that, that people would be saved, that lives would be changed. That is what we are about as a church. That is our primary mission, to perpetuate the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word, as Paul calls it here. So Paul certainly understood that it was important to pray for other people, but we must primarily pray that God's word would go forward. He prays that, uh, that, that his colleagues would be blessed. He would, he's praying that his missionary activities would be blessed. And yes, it involves some of those other areas as well. It, it involves our health. It involves our abilities. And so we pray about those matters. So Paul prayed that the word of God would spread rapidly or speed ahead. And this is this idea, almost a, this image of the competition of the Olympics. It's like a runner who's running with strenuous effort. That is the idea Paul is saying. He's praying this way, that this task is important, and you train for it, just like a runner would. You run with all that's within you because you're a runner. How many runners train to fail? How many athletes train to fail? None, I don't think. I think if you're going to train, you're, you're training to win. You're training to be the best. You're training to compete. And this is the idea here as Paul is talking about the spread of the gospel. With strenuous effort, we should run our race. Our Christian life has been equated and called a race over and over from the word of God. And so we are to run this Christian life in this manner. J.B. Lightfoot puts it this way. He translates this passage here. Paul is praying that you may be, have a triumphant career. I, I like that word career in that sentence because it, it describes the importance of this task, that it is our job. It is our career. A career is lifelong. I mean, yes, here in America, we have this this concept and this idea of retirement, and that's good. I look forward to that day as many of you have already arrived and many are heading in that direction. But in the Christian life, there's no retirement. We have a career that God has called us to and we continue pursuing that call. We continue pursuing that career. And so Paul says, he's praying and he's asking his people around, those who are reading this letter, to pray for him that he might continue to strive to please the Lord no matter what. It's a race. He calls the Christian to run this race and to present the word of God with honor. In Philippians 3.13, Paul said this, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. And there's this high calling as a Christian to continue to persevere and to pursue and to do what God has called us to do. We are in competition. But you know who our greatest adversary is almost all the time? I know you're thinking Satan, but he's not. Our greatest competition, our greatest adversary, oftentimes is our own selves because we become comfortable. We arrive, we think we've made it, and there's no place in the Christian life for that. We need to continue to push forward. We are our greatest adversary. So Paul, he calls on us to run with dignity, with pride, not pride, but pride in the message, carrying this message. He calls on us to run with honor and dignity with the constant onslaught of the adversary, we must run with honor, with dignity, and we must run this race unapologetic. Paul says God himself must establish us. The only way that this will happen is if God himself is the one who's working in our life. Paul said he wanted the word, that is the saving word, the sanctifying word, to move swiftly, to run and he wants to, it to keep moving 
and running like a strong runner, moving ahead across the land without obstruction, without hindrance, making rapid progress. That is what Paul is praying for. And we've seen it throughout the ages. We call it revival fires. We need that once again. We need to see God's Holy Spirit moving across our land. And the only way that we will ever see a change, the only way that we will ever see a difference is for God's Holy Spirit just to be unleashed in such a way that there's a Holy Spirit revival that just crosses our country. That is how we must be praying. In verse 5, Paul says, in the hopes that that it is God who establishes the Thessalonians, he prayed that God would direct their heart. That means that that we, we have a change of heart, that God has to come into our thinking process and begin to retool it. Our minds are corrupt with the thoughts of the world. Our minds are consumed with the things of this life. And so Paul is asking that the Holy Spirit direct the thoughts, the innermost thoughts of these people. He prays it for us. He asks it about us as well. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, There is a way that seems right into a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. So when we are thinking our own thoughts, we are living our own way, it ultimately leads to death. So we must pray and ask God to direct our path. That requires that we we yield our thinking to Him. We yield our patterns of thought to Him. We must yield to the Lord who is always faithful and He alone will establish us. So the third thing we see in verse 3, the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. See, Paul asked that they might pray that he be kept or rescued from evil and faithless men. Paul described these antagonists as morally depraved and malicious individuals. And that's who people who oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ are. Think about people in the world around us who are opposed to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They, as Paul would describe them here, they are morally depraved. They're malicious. They're antagonistic. And so he was asking that prayer warriors might pin down the enemy around him and that the name of Jesus might be elevated. You see, everywhere you come into contact with people, there's an opportunity for an antagonist to be around you someone who is malicious toward the gospel. And if you are a gospel light, they want nothing more than to snuff that light out. And so we need to be very careful and very understanding that there is an evil one who wants to deceive, he wants to destroy, and he wants to defeat you, and he wants to hold you down. So Paul is praying. He's asking for people to pray because he had some serious enemies of the message of the gospel. See, and all, all of us do as well. So Paul just prayed that the people would petition God for the safety of the messenger, safety of the missionary, and safety of the preacher of the proclamation of the gospel. See, in this case, he was asking that he be delivered from the evil men. And in his mind, these individuals were people who were out of place or They did contrary to what was right. These were people who possibly knew good and chose to do wrong. It's people who had the law in front of them and they opted to do something evil and devious against Paul because he was preaching something slightly different than what they understood. And so Paul calls them out. He calls them irrational people. He calls them evil people. He calls them malignant, aggressive, and wicked people. And that's what the people are who oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know it's happening today because in our world today, right is called wrong. Think about the things that you know that are right in our world today. I mean, you can look at our political situation. You can look at the legislation that's coming down uh, from on high where they have little bathrooms that anybody can use, anybody can have any gender. Uh, In our world today, uh, there's no male or female according to them, and, and men can compete in women's sports. This is wrong. This is unethical. These people are antagonistic toward God's design and ultimately antagonistic toward the truth. 
Right is called wrong, and wrong is called right. Now if you stand in opposition to those things, you get canceled. You get knocked out. You get taken out of the scene. And so Paul is saying, pray against these men. Pray against the evil ones. And we have a priority in our Christian life to pray about what's going on for the lack of perpetuation of the gospel, for the prevention of the, the, those who prevent the spread of the gospel, those who say the gospel is wrong. You see, the wicked and evil men he refers to, they're unbelieving men who are antagonistic to the message of the gospel, those who turn their back on the truth. So despite what was happening, Paul knew God was faithful. And we, can, we understand this. No matter what is going on in the world today, God is sovereign and we can still trust him. And Paul knew God's plan could be trusted because God is faithful despite what had happened in his own personal life. Acts 17 verses 2 through 6 record Paul's normal activities when he was in the synagogue and he was expounding the scriptures. He was explaining that Jesus was the Messiah. Some listened and some became angry. But the, as, it, as it reads here, but the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar. These jealous men, they accused Paul of causing chaos, of usurping governmental authority. The methods are the same today. I don't know if you have been reading the news lately. Uh, just in the last few weeks, there was a Canadian pastor who, uh, during this coronavirus shutdown, they, had their, they arrived at a place where they started having services again. And 500 people, just a few Sundays ago, I think it was 500 people came to this service just so they could hear the proclamation of God's word. Do you know what happened? He was arrested. What was he arrested for? For for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, they, they used it, the COVID as a cover. And they said that you're doing something wrong by having all these people and exposing them to the coronavirus. But he said he was going to proclaim the word. And so fast forward a few weeks, that was this last week. And they came to him, they were going to put him out on bail. They said, uh, you have an opportunity. If you say you won't preach, you won't pastor your flock, you want to do anything church-related, we'll let you out on, on bail. Do you know what his answer was? He says, if I do that, I'm not a pastor. I'm not, I'm not even a, in some ways he's saying, I'm not even a Christian if I can renounce what God has called me to do. And I can turn my back on what God has called me to do. And the, the government there, they said that this man was wrong. Now, let's, let's flip over the page of the newspaper just a second. There was a second story from the same area. Edmonton, Alberta. And in the same story, or the same page of, of the news, the government let a, let a convict out of prison. This man was a, a child sex offender. And, and so they put out this proclamation that they were letting this man out. And they said, watch your families. This was their words. Watch your families. This man, he will commit a crime again. And so they let this, this criminal out. And this man who was preaching the gospel, he's still in prison. And we say it can't happen here in the United States of America. Think about what happened in California just during this coronavirus shutdown. There were churches who were still meeting. People were just showing up at church because they wanted to hear the proclamation of God's word. And what happened? Uh, they were taken into court. Some churches were fined. Fast, take a, a step over to, uh, I think it's Nevada. Well, they could have the brothels open. They could have the casinos open. But don't open the churches. These are essential over here. But don't proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the world we're living in. It is an evil time. That is why we must proclaim the word of God. That is why we must be people of prayer. It begins as we pray. Pray for one another. You know, I pray for you. Because you're in places I don't go. You're in... You, you meet people and you see people that I don't see. Some of you work with individuals that maybe they're Christians, maybe they're not. And maybe it's so easy for you to, to start siding up with that way of thinking. Well, Christian friend, we need to pray for one another. We say it can't happen here in South Carolina, but who says it can't? We say it can't happen in the mountains. Who says it can't? 
What if our government suddenly makes a decree that we cannot get together? What are we going to do? We live in an evil and a diabolical day, and it's time for us to be people of prayer. Pray about this. Pray about the evil circumstance and the evil situation around us. We must pray. And so Paul said, pray for him. Pray for him. You see, Paul, he requested prayer for deliverance and preservation from the human forces that opposed the progression of the Christian mission. In 2 Corinthians, it involves Paul praying and Paul asking for deliverance from his adversaries. Paul in Romans 15 prayed that he might not suffer at the hands of his opponents. He doesn't necessarily ask for self-preservation, simply that the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ would continue on. You know, as Paul was moved out of the way, there were the people that he influenced along the journey that suddenly took up the mantle and started becoming those who proclaimed the message. And everywhere he went and everywhere we go, we should leave somebody who can share that message, who can proclaim and can take that message. So Paul was often hindered. He was hindered by suspicion by the Jews. He was hindered by suspicion with Jewish Christians. He was hindered with active malice by the Jews of the diaspora. He was hindered with imprisonment, by shipwrecks, by the opposition of apostates such as Elymas the sorcerer and the demons that possessed the soul of the slave girl at Philippi. He was continually hindered. He was hindered by his own discouragement. He told the Corinthians later that he knew what it was to be handicapped on all sides, to be perplexed, persecuted, and put down. He understood, and prayer was the only resource that he had. Prayer is the only power that can aid you. I mean, you might have enough energy and strength to go a little bit. But if our our journey as Christians is truly a race, what is it that energizes us? It's God's word and prayer. We pray for ourselves and we pray for one another. Prayer is the only power that can aid you. Prayer is the only power that can minister to you by, because in so doing, you're asking for God's Holy Spirit to work in you. Prayer is the only thing that can carry you and help you on this difficult journey. Prayer helps you persevere, and prayer will put that fire in your bosom. Prayer is the only thing that can guide you. Prayer is the only thing that can change you. And correct your thinking. So as we take prayer, we couple it with God's word. That is how we change. That is how we grow. That is how we mature. And that is how we become effective as Christians. So this morning, this morning as we close in just a moment for in a time of decision, I want you to realize the importance of praying because God God is faithful. As it said in verse 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and he will guard you against the evil one. It is God and God alone. We owe him everything. We must trust him fully no matter what's going on in our lives. No matter how, how difficult that may seem, it's more difficult when we take this journey on our own. So this morning, that's the challenge that we would pray for one another. If you would, please bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we we come to you at this time and we pray for, for your blessings, Lord. Lord, not that we would be blessed for comfort's sake, but that we would be blessed for the sake of the gospel. Sometimes, Lord, I get so caught up in and this or that, the things that I want, it's easy to neglect the importance of sharing the gospel, being a gospel light, and proclaiming that message. I pray that you'd help me, Lord. I pray that you'd help our congregation, Lord, that we would be people of prayer, that we would pray for one another. Lord, that it's not a burden to utter just a few words. We don't have to say a lot. Just, Lord, bless so-and-so, keep them. Lord, guide so-and-so and and keep and help us, Father, to be 
faithful to that. Help us to be people of prayer. And Father, we just pray that during this time of decision, that you would help us all to decide to pray for one another and for the mission that you've called us to do, Father, that we might be faithful. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. If you would please stand as we sing our hymn of decision. Number 416, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. 416. My hope for you today is that you would pray for one another. Pray for me as I pray for you. Pray for one another. Pray that the gospel message would be proclaimed and that you would be part of sharing that message. And as we close today, that's my hope and my challenge for you. If you would, please bow your heads as we, as we uh, have our benediction and we're dismissed. Father, help us this day to remember what you've called us to do. And that's to be lights, to be bearers of the light. And also, Lord, help us recognize the importance of praying for one another. Father, that we should continue to pray and encourage one another. Lord, when, when times that some of us may not even know that someone else is praying, but I pray you'd put it in our hearts to pray for one another. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>